Okay, welcome everyone to this uh, seminar. Uh, please allow me to introduce uh, Anne Virginia Salsak, a CNRS professor and the head of biological fluid structure interaction research group in biomechanics and bioengineering laboratory in uh, Compiègne, France. Um, Anne Virginia is uh, well known for her original experimental and numerical work um, uh, in uh, blood flows. And in 2017, she received an ERC uh, to work on multiphysics study of dynamics, uh, resistance, and delivery potential of deformable microcapsules. So in, your, in recognition of her uh, work, she has been awarded various prizes, including the CNRS Bronze Medal, uh, Trophy de Femme Honor in 2015, and a Medal of the National Order of Merit in 2016. Um, today, uh, she will tell us about fluid structure interactions of a microcapsule and flow. So please welcome Anne Virginia and thank you for, for talking today. Thank you very much, Masha. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you to all of you. I wish uh, we were together. But, uh, thanks to the, uh, the, the magic aspect of uh, internet, we are at least uh, together, which is really nice. So today I would like to speak to you a little bit more about fluid structure interaction. So we take a capsule, you have an example of one capsule flowing down the channel. And I would like to emphasize how we can create a dialogue between numerical simulation and microfluidic experiments and how one can feed the other. So this work has been done in Compiègne. The work, of course, is not only my work, as you can imagine. So I'll show you a picture of many of my colleagues at the end, but I really want to acknowledge that it's a group work, uh, and I'm really showing you results of the entire group, biofluids uh, group that I'm leading in Compiègne University. Uh, okay, now it's working. So first of all, what is a caps? Well, we're all made of capsule, as you know, because you can take, you can see the red blood cells as, as a capsule. It's a very good example of capsule if, because we're gonna take as definition of a capsule, a fluid droplet protected by a membrane. Of course, there are many other natural examples, uh, fish eggs and all the eggs can be an, uh, other ones. Uh, but what is interesting is that microcapsules have found many applications uh, in industry. They, and many of these applications are linked to bioengineering and to pharmaceutics. So two things that are really linked uh, to the living system and to to bio, bioengineering in general. So what is interesting in this, if we look a little bit at what is used, is that in practice, in medicine, the strategies that are the most used is to use very small particles and very small vectors. So the particles that are used are tend to be nanoparticles, which are in that case rigid and not deformable. And another big group of vectors are liposomes, where the little uh, lipid molecules that protect the inner core uh, line all along uh, the vector, but same thing, they are very small. The reason why these strategies have been used so far is that these vectors can then grow, go through all the barriers and there is no risk of uh, blockage in the circulation. But the big limitation is that there is a very small amount of uh, active material that can be used uh, and that can be encapsulated within the vector. So another, so the objective would be uh, to try to use deformable micrometric capsules. So this capsule will be completely huge compared to the existing strategies. These capsules uh, will be made of a membrane. So there is the need to have a membrane that is thick enough to protect the inner core, but still, uh, but still deformable uh, to to be able. To so that the product can go through and can be delivered to the right place. So the membrane is a triple role. It has a role of protection, a role of transport because the whole uh, object needs to be transported to go to the uh, targeted location in the body, and there is the need to control the release. That is the big objective is to find how to understand the deformation of uh, microcapsules and to how to control it so that when we create a microcapsule, we're able uh, to design an object that is safe enough to be injected in the body. And by then, all the studies, we will also provide information on all the objects, whether they're natural 
in the biomimetic models of cells, but also uh, for all the applications uh, of microencapsulation. So let's see, let's look at the challenges. Well, let's take a capsule and, let, and we put it in flail. Well, we directly see that it's a strongly multi-physics form because the, the membrane is entrained. So here we have the case of a capsule that was initially spherical, placed under a shear flow, and the capsule gets deformed, uh, a steady state. So if we look again, you see initially it was round, then it tilts, uh, tilts uh, because of the flow, and then the membrane is entrained uh, over time, so there is this tank trending motion. If we then place the same capsule, but in a confined flow, we, have, we find this, shapes, capsule shapes and capsule deformation that are very similar to red blood cells. So we find again these parachute shapes that are very well known for for micro for red blood cells, where the capsule that was initially round becomes curved in the back. And this is because this is due to the high uh, viscous forces that act on the membrane. That can even lead to, and you can guess on the pictures, that you can have different phenomena like wrinkling. Here we see wrinkles that form in the azimutal direction, and we can go all the way to breakup. So here we have we are in an extreme case where the capsule has to go through a snap uh, conversion. And so the capsule was taken by the flow, arrived at the, at the location uh, where we had the constriction, and then you see that he manages to go through, but sometimes he, he flows through and sometimes he breaks. Now the question is, in, in case we want to put all these objects that are very thin, uh, with a very thin membrane, we need to be able to understand all these phenomena to control it and to be able to predict where the, the delivery of the product will be. So, to find, so there, is the, there is this need to find a compromise between the payload, which is the amount of active product that is uh, encapsulated within the capsule, the deformability of the object, its resistance, and the release. The release can be done by two ways, either through diffusion, it's a slow release just uh, by diffusion across the membrane, and another one is can be kind of uh, stimulated uh, externally or can be, or by sheer force, either by sheer forces or by ultrasound. There are many ways to trigger a local release uh, that would be due to, to a local break. So to do that, we, there is a big need for advanced biomedical de devices uh, to be able to study the formal microcapsules in flame. And there is the need not only to have advanced tools on the numerical side, but also on the experimental side. And so we have tried to come up with all these tools. One and one advantage if we combine experiments and numerical work is that at the cross cutoff between these two worlds is the world of characterization. Indeed, to characterize, if we know, if we find a given shape experimentally, if we need a, then a model of exactly the same situation if we want to get back and identify the mechanical properties. So we'll see how to do so. I want to, to go a little bit how, how to be precise and how to be able to do such, uh, such experiments and, and build up the numerical models, knowing that in case we are able to characterize objects that are as small as a few microns, that's a huge step forward as so far there is only techniques that are local techniques that are then tedious to do because every object needs to be tested independently. But if we then use numerical advanced tools that are numeric numerical and micro 3D experiments, there is a way to bring a solution to a certain location for, char for, for characterization and then to still let it go without having uh, perturbed the properties very much. So today's talks, uh, my objectives are to introduce numerical models and micro approaches to understand the dynamics of microcapsule in a channel. We'll see the wrinkle, see how to characterize uh, the properties. So that will be the practical aspect uh, is to go all the way to the characterization of the elastic properties. And then we'll just say a few words on how to get also the viscous properties that we need relaxation phenomena to occur. And at the end, I will 
kind of uh, I want since I want to, today to meet to make experiments meet with numerical work, I, I'll show you uh, the reverse example where it's actually numerical studies that were that came first and that had an idea and and that and then we decided to do the experiments that would go along with it and we ended up finding very interesting results. So this is the, the goal of today. Let's start with a numerical approach, and I I'm going to tell you a little bit more on how uh, what is so nice about studying microcapsules in flow. Well, it's a special problem uh, where we have two fluids, an inner fluid and an external fluid. Both of them have neg negligible inertia. So in the case where the balance number is very small, so we can assume that the equations to be solved are the Stokes flow equations. We'll have then an equilibrium between pressure forces and viscous forces in this case of so the equations are in the, in the box. So we have the conservation of mass on the left and the conservation of con momentum on the right. So these equations uh, will be at, uh, the peculiarity of being linear, uh, which will be really nice because then we we can use uh, methods like the boundary integral method, for example, to solve them, the numerical part. Then we have a, a solid problem, uh, and the two are strongly coupled. The, on the solid side, uh, we are dealing with a wall that is very thin. Here on the right, on the top right, I'm showing you an image of the wall. Uh, it's an image taken under the microscope, uh, electronic microscope. And you see that the, the thickness, so that's when the membrane is dehydrated, but you see a thickness less than one micron. So even when it's hydrated, it's something about one micron. And that was for an object, a capsule that was 50 microns in radius, so 100 in diameter. So the, the ratio between the thickness and the radius of the diameter is still very small. So we're dealing with a very thin st structure. And because of that, you can we can neglect the thickness the thickness or integrate over the thickness. And so we will speak in terms of tension T and not stress, uh, because we will integrate the stress over uh, the, the thickness and speak in terms of tension. Same thing, same, uh, since the objects are very small and the membrane is very thin, uh, the energy of the material is negligible, but we are dealing with large deformations. So it's a, uh, 2D surface that can still dimension through in space in the 3D world. Uh, and we have uh, possible distortion, elongation, curvature changes uh, when the capsule deforms. The local equilibrium is given in on the right. And you see that you have an equilibrium between the external forces, so the forces induced by the shear force, the, the viscous forces. Uh, from the two fluids. And this is balanced by the internal forces within the membrane, so the recipient of uh, tension, uh, the gradient along the surface that balances the external force. Now, in terms of uh, the governing parameters, where well, we have three and a false one, which is the mechanical behavior of the wall. So it depends, so of course, the wall has a given uh, constitutive law, it follows a given constitutive law depending on its composition. There are two main laws that have been used to find the literature. The first one is the Neohookian law, so which is a one special case of the Moon and Rivlin uh, equation. And it's, uh, it's a case where we really easy to use for objects that are soft, strain softening in terms of behavior. So strain softening materials uh, are defined by uh, a pressure or a tension that would decrease when the more you stretch on the material, the easier it gets to stretch it. So this is, uh, we have shown in the past, and I'll show you today that that works really well for albumin capsule or for any protein, any, any material that is made of polymer. So any material that is kind of designed by human beings and that it, there's only one component uh, these laws work really well. But for biological uh, tissues, uh, well, this law does not work because biological tissues tend to be strain softening, strain hardening, sorry. And so the scalar law that has been used for a long time is one law that has been 
that is uh, that can be thought of but i will show you a bit later on that actually we can also use uh, the generalized hooke's law uh, which provides the same result uh, then so this is so that was just to give you the two the different laws that we will uh, look at then in terms of governing parameters the non-dimensional parameters we're really fond of uh, non-dimensional parameters in free mechanics so here are the here are the ones governing the capsule deformation. The first one I should have put capillary number with brackets. It's, it's an elastic capillary number because directly you see that I'm talking about GS, the, the surface elastic uh, surface modulus, surface elastic modulus of the membrane. Uh, so I'm comparing with this capillary number the viscous force and used by the fluids or the fluid flows uh, as with respect to the elastic forces or the response of the membrane, which is a bit different to what is done with the drops. So it's an extension of the definition of uh, what is done in the world of drops. The second number, so, the, so this number first will tell you how deform the capsule, the, well, the capsule deformation will be a balance between the viscous forces that are uh, that put that force the capsule to deform and the elastic forces that force well the membrane wants to retract and resist to the deformation the other number is the viscosity ratio which uh, is the ratio between the internal viscosity and the external one so for for the red blood cell the for example the cytoplasm is very viscous compared to the external flow uh, which is plasma. So there is typically a ratio of eight or something, uh, definitely more than five. In the experiment that I will show you, we'll do the reverse because we'll take a microcapsule with a, a, flu a water solution inside and outside we will put glycerol. Glycerol has a very high viscosity. It's, it has a viscosity 1000 times that of water. And thanks to this very high viscosity, we'll have high shear forces so very high deformation. And that way we will be able to investigate large capillary numbers. So we'll have, we'll, in practice, we will work with a capillary number that is either very small or may, if the fluids manage to, to, if, to, to balance between in the inside and the outside, we'll actually have a viscosity ratio of one because the membrane is a little bit uh, porous, so porous enough for an exchange to take place. The last uh, governing parameter is the size ratio. When you're dealing with a capsule within a confined range, so there'll be two length size. A will be the size of the round capsule, because initially the capsule is vertical, and L is the half size channel. If the channel is cylindrical, then it's the radius, but if it's a square channel like in microfluidics, then it will be the half length of the channel. So these are the three governing parameters. So it's really nice because, and the viscosity ratio will be set in, by the experiment. So in the end, end up having only two governing parameters. Now, let how to form? Well, the best way to solve it is to do a Lagrangian tracking. Uh, so when we initially we know where the capsule is, where the nodes of all this are, and we will track, uh, follow their trajectory over time. So at time t, any point that was at location capital X will be at location small x at time t. And we're going to follow the points over time and do this Lagrangian tracking. So unfortunately, the, well, the, the counterbalance is that this scheme is very uh, the, the disadvantage is that we need to use explicit time schemes and that will imply very small delta t's so the computation will be small will be long on the fluid side i've put different groups because we are definitely not the only one in the world to look at the forms and so, so many people have taken into account the equation that uh, stokes stokes for equations and so in that case we can use either boundary integral methods which as which we do or the spectral methods uh, but we also and we also investigated how to use the full navier stokes equation in that case we can also take into account inertia and for experiment we have shown that inertia needs to be taken into account whenever the Reynolds number starts to be above one up to one the result doesn't change and inertia does not play a role. When it becomes to be about 10, 
then inertia starts to play a role and the results are different. So in that case, the only way is to have a normal uh, Navier-Stokes solver and to use immersed boundary, uh, the immersed boundary method to couple with a solid solver. Then in terms of solid solvers, for a long time, many people use local equilibrium, so lo local equations, but that, was, uh, that has a limitation whenever the folds or wrinkles form the simulations tend to be uh, unstable. So there is an, an advantage of using the, the weak form of the equations and one method, the finite element method uh, that is based on weak, the weak form of the equation. So we're, the, we're on our side, we're using this method and find it very convenient, the fact that we, we have an integral form uh, on, this, on the solid side. And since we also have an integral form on the fluid side, we end up with codes that are very stable. There was some, maybe there was someone talking. No, I thought there was an interruption. Don't hesitate in case there is. Uh, one advantage of using the finite element method is also that we can extend the, the numerical codes to shells. And so we, there is the possibility to include bending resistance. Now, just as a schematic here, I'm showing you how the code will work and the, the coupling uh, works out. So uh, at every, any time, you always know where the nodes are. So you know the, the displacement of so the nodes, uh, whether you're at the initial time or at any time t. So this is the, the, the beginning of, your, of the loop, of the, of the free structure loop. Uh, so knowing the, the displacements through the elastic constitutive law, we know the tensions, and then we input that into the solid solver, solve for the local, uh, so for the equilibrium uh, using the finite element method. The unknown is Q, the, the external force, so because that's, that's the big issue why we need to do this Lagrangian tracking is that we do not know the viscous forces acting on the, on the capsule. But through the solid code, if we work that way, we get the unknown. And then we feed this unknown to the solid, to the fluid uh, solver. So this, uh, the, because you see that there is a, a, a boundary condition that tells you that the load acting on the membrane is equal to the internal stresses. So this sigma dot n is actually equals to Q, which has been found uh, from the solid solver. And now you, we end up with something that is simple to solve since the velocity provided by the boundary integral method, so that's the velocity of the nodes of the capsule, is equal to the undisturbed velocity plus a perturbation just because there is a membrane. So the presence of the capsule induces a perturbation which is calculated through this integral. So you integrate over the nodes of the capsule. So these intervals are quite time consuming numerically, but they're very precise. So that's the advantage. And once we know the velocity, we just have to integrate over time. There is, the, the boundary, well, there is another boundary integral, uh, boundary condition that tells you, so that's the kinematic coupling, that tells you that the velocity uh, falls is equal to, uh, of the fluid is equal to du dt. So we get the mu uh, from that. In case there is a valid flow, the, this equation that we see here is extra term. So I just wanted to point this out that we also we have extra contribution because we have other walls. So we have the contribution from the friction. The, the fluid is also uh, applied is applying a friction onto the external wall, so it has to be taken account through this term. And there is a pressure drop because of the friction as well. So there is a pressure drop between the inside and the outside, uh, in the inlet and the outlet. Uh, so this this is this equation, this last term that has to be uh, calculated when there is uh, when we are in the boundary case. Uh, in the boundary case, we have extra boundary conditions. Uh, so there is the no slave boundary condition on the external wall, and we have the extra pressure that has to be calculated. Disturbed velocity uh, takes well can be two. It depends on the shape of the channel. If the channel is has a circular uh, section, then you recognize the parabolic uh, flow from Poiset. And on and below, I, I gave you the equation if it's a square channel. So here it's a series. It's an infinite series with all the uh, an even terms uh, for n, uh, but so it's uh, you, each time you, you correct, but you don't need many terms uh, to have 
uh, for the series to converge well. So now let's look at the results. So here I'm showing you a comparison between simulation in the cylindrical channels and simulation in a square channel on the right. Uh, it would be interesting because experimentally we can use both. Either we use small cylinders that can be glass capillaries, or we use microfluidic channels. And as you know, because of soft lithography techniques, we always create channels that are straight on the straight wall. So they end up being square channels or rectangular channels. So it's important to be able to know the capsule deformation in such a situation. Well, uh, we directly see, so here uh, the colors give you the negative tensions. I, I decided to show you, I can show you the movies again. And we directly see, well, by look, comparing the two movies, is that we have more compression and more negative tension when the capsule is in the cylindrical channels. And this is due to the fact that the capsule is more confined. Because in, on the right, we have the external corners and there is flow, well, the flow is almost unconfined in the corners of the channel. And that's uh, this increased uh, compression zone, compression within the cylindrical, cylindrical channel shows also, if we look at the, uh, the shape of the capsule. So here we have the two profiles. We have the profile in the axial plane, and we have the cross cap, the cross profile below in B. And in, in blue, you have the results, the shapes of the capsule for the cylindrical channel, and in red for the microfluidic channel, which is, uh, so, which is a square in shape. So we see much more wrinkles, and you see that the capsule is more elongated axially, so along the, the ax, uh, axis of the channel, uh, when the when the cylinder uh, when it's a cylinder, and uh, but we also see more wrinkles, uh, and which is just due to the high confinement. These wrinkles are physical. Just in case you wonder whether it's an artifact of a numerical simulation, I'm showing you again a, a picture from experimental results, and you see that we have a continuous wavelength. In case when it's a circular channel, but we have this. Uh, whenever the capsule starts to be big, a bit bigger, and by bigger I mean when it's typical when the capsule size to be is of the order of the channel size. So you need this confinement to be the confinement ratio to be about one. In that case, we see the the wrinkles forming. Now that's the on this slide I show you the effect of the law. As we said that uh, it was important to to be able to to distinguish the behaviors. Now let's see whether it actually plays a role or not. So here we are looking at the effect of the uh, of the laws. So you see that whenever you go to higher capillary numbers, you really see a, a large effect. It's true that at small capillary numbers, maybe the effect is not that big, but you, when you start to increase the capillary number, here you, you have a capillary number uh, of 0.1 for, for a micro capsule flowing in a channel. And you see uh, definitely the, not the same deformation. When the capsule is strain hardening, it elongates much less than when the capsule, the, this strain softening behavior you're really at the limit. You start to have pointed ends. So we are at the limit where there is a steady state solution. And above that, you, you, you no longer, you're no longer able to predict a steady state. So that's the limitation of a strain softening material is that it should uh, stretch it too much. Well, at one point it flows, it really deforms like chewing gum and you stretch and stretch and stretch until it breaks up. So there is no longer a steady solution. So now what is interesting is that we can go, well, have a, kind of generate a full database of results. So by changing the capillary number and the, the aspect ratio, we, uh, we generated all the results and there is the limit above this line, there is no steady state. So that's why we, we did not compute anything above the dotted line because above, we no longer have, well, the, above the capsule is a chewing gum. So it just flows forever until it breaks. Uh, and here, um, just to give you an example, you see that if you keep the size, the capsule size constant, but change the capillary number, you see the effect of changing the capillary number. So the more the capillary number, the more deformed the capsule. And you can go from, you change shape, there is a change in topology, because in one, for example, 
the capsule was still uh, with a reverse, well, was still uh, kind of with a, uh, a curvature, the initial curvature at the back, and then uh, you have a parachute shape that forms when you increase the capillary number. So now let's see. Now the question is, how can we identify the mechanical properties of a capsule, uh, if we create microcapsules in the lab, are we able to identify the mechanical properties? The classical technique to do so on small objects is to, is to use either micropipette or to use AFM, so atomic force microscopy. In both cases, well, in the first case, the idea is to aspirate a little bit of the membrane, and depending on the length that has gone through the needle, uh, knowing the delta p, the um, difference in pressure, we can deduce the properties of the uh, of the membrane. And with the atomic force microscopy, the idea is to do indentation, and to and then you, if you have a model of the indentation of uh, of the micro of, of the wall, you can then deduce the property of the wall. These techniques are very classical. They're used a lot also on cells. Uh, they they have only one limitation. So they can be, they, they're quite tedious to do because every object needs to be manipulated individually, placed under, uh, under the, the location where it's uh, tested. And since we're testing an object that is round, it's actually not easy at all to do AFM because the, the particles want to flow, what, to leave and to, to go away. So these are experiments are actually not easy at all. So what we end up with, we propose to use microfluidics and to do a simple experiment to use a, simple, a straight channel. So the experiment looks almost too simple because the capsules are just flowing, the capsule suspension is flowing through the, the micro channel, which can be either cylindrical, like on the left, or square, like on the right. Uh, but the advantage is that we have the numerical codes to, to uh, then uh, backtrack and 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 use the well, or identify the properties for the, the experiments. If we can then take any suspension of capsule, have a little bit flowing into the testing device. And so the, uh, on the industrial side, it's something much easier to implement than all the existing techniques. So how we fabricate the capsule. We typically uh, fabricate capsule using proteins. Uh, which is, uh, we're following a technique uh, from Florence Edwards Levy in Reims, uh, where they, they, they do the cross-linking uh, of, the, of the proteins, creating bonds between the, the acetated groups uh, of, the, uh, of the caps, of the, of the membrane of the protein, and the linking agent. So that way, uh, we end up having something with real bonds, uh, so it's a, it's a full reticulation uh, and that will provide elastic properties with a shape memory, a memory of the shape. Uh, but at the same time, it's an interfacial reaction because the linking agent is put inside the oil and cannot go in, uh, into the, the inside the core of the capsule. So the membrane is created just at the interface between the oil solution, the oil external emulsion and, and, the, and the, the droplet. And that way we end up having very, very thin membranes. So we create the capsule with a stirring speed of about 10 RPM. We let the reticulation time uh, occur for about 15 minutes, and then uh, we have changed the concentration, but I'll show you results for 20% BSA concentration. So the capsule uh, that I will show you, for which I will show you results, have a radius of about 50 microns. Of course, it's a distribution because we are creating first an emulsion uh, of the, the protein solution into oil. So we'll have, so we, we use then seeds to, to only have a given range of sizes that is close to the capsule, to the channel size. And then this capsule that we see here, here with a reticulated membrane are suspended in glycerol with a viscosity initially of 1200. Uh, but then since we put a little bit of water from the capsule suspension, we end up having a viscosity just, that is just below 1000 pascal second. So we'll, and then we do the experiment of having the 
caps micro capsule suspension flow into the microtangle. Uh, so either we use microcritic channels that are created in the lab using soft lithography, as you see on the left, the bottom left, always use uh, something that is quite clever uh, is to use a very small microcapillary gloss, uh, made in glass, and then we just put them in an external uh, channel so that it's easy to connect uh, to the to the pressure to the syringe pump, whatever fluid where the flow is created by any device. So you see here that the the inner tube, the inner tube through which the capsule flows, is placed within a, a second capillary tube, uh, and everything is embedded into PDMS, so that uh, we can have a good visualization and we look at the capsule through a flat surface. So then we can take images of microcapsule flowing through the microchannel. And we, since we take, we use a high speed camera, so we have many pictures of the, of the microcapsule and knowing the speed of the, the capsule, so we can deduce the speed of the capsule. We also do image processing to get a curve. Uh, we can get the total length of the capsule. We can deduce the parachute depth. And then the goal is to look in the database which numerical simulation fits the best to this uh, profile. And because if we have a good over, uh, fit uh, and overlap between the experimental and numerical profile, then we will know, we'll identify the capital number. And since we know you, uh, the velocity. If we if, if we know we know we know the viscosity, and if we are able to identify the velocity of the fluid, then we will be able to know the uh, surface capillary number, which is the the information we are looking for, the mechanical properties. So there is also the need. So VC the the capsule velocity is known. We don't know initially a because every capsule is a different shape. Uh, so the goal is within the identification is to identify A, to identify U, and to identify the capillary number. If we know these three values, then we're able to, do, to deduce uh, GS, the surface capillary number. So for that, we, we really felt the need to optimize the process, and we needed a real-time identification technique that is based on the data that we had. So we put up, well, we, we created a technique that is data driven. So offline, we do the numerical simulation and then we do the identification. How do we do the identification? Let, let me go through it. Well, we take the database that we, we talked about before. So we have all the simulation with all the values of parameters, as long as we get a steady state. So we are below the dotted line. And for each capsule in the numerical database, we can deduce the same, same length and uh, parachute shape as what is done experimentally. Then numerically, the advantage of the offline stage is that we know the link. We know the link between the space of parameters, so the values of capital number, size ratio and velocity ratio, and how these values are linked to the, surf, the geometric characteristics of the capsule shape when it's deformed. So that's quite interesting that, to, that we know the link. And, we, and also, if you look at these pictures, you see that actually all the admissible solutions lie onto hypersurfaces. So, if, so that tells you that for a capsule, so you cannot have any shape. The shape, the deformed shape, has to obey and to be to lie on these hypersurfaces. Otherwise, it's not uh, an admissible solution. So we, to, the the objective now is if is the, that's the the our challenge is if we have an experimental result. So let's take this image. We are, uh, we back, we we then backtrack the values uh, of the the geometric values for this capsule. So we are, we, are, we, we are somewhere within this space of geometric characteristics. And now we need to find where we, the corresponding point in the space of parameters. So the, the question is how to deduce the value of CA and all the other values, A over L and velocity ratio, because if we know the three parameters, then we can deduce GS. To do so, we propose to use 
diffuse approximation and manifold uh, walking. So the, the concept of manifold is to walk on these hypersurfaces and diffuse approximation is the, con the concept is simple. It's just to do an interval locally within the neighborhood uh, and using all the solutions and numerical solutions close to the experimental point. So we do that, we take the point that was measured experimentally, we projected it onto the hypersurface, otherwise it's not a proper solution. We know that it has to lie on the hypersurface, so we put it, we put it onto it, and then we just use this interpolation. Uh, so we get the values of the three parameters, just doing a more Penrose pseudo inverse, which is a mathematical tool. But so this problem is well posed and we can deduce uh, the solution, the, the three values of uniquely uh, given a set of values of experimental value. So that's quite interesting. So it's a little bit of mathematics behind, but in the end, we and it's all kind of using tools from the data-driven uh, world, uh, all the people that are creating uh, models and how to use data and, and that uh, we used it for, for the identification. So in the end, so let's take, now let's go back to our microcapsule that was made of albumin. And we then do the, we get the experimental fit in orange. And then we, we calculated the, uh, we looked into the database the databases for the strain softening uh, properties, so for strain softening law, and also for the strain hardening one. And when we discovered that the, using Scalac law or the generalist Hooke's law provided exactly the same result. So we prove that generalist Hooke's law is more general because then that can be generalized to 3D material, whereas Scalac law is a 2D law, so it has no equivalent in the 3D world. So there is really, a, it's quite interesting to have a, a constitutive, constitutive law uh, that is possible, that exists for 3D materials and that can be generated to 2D ones. So both of them are true as true also for any law. And here are the results on the right. So we, we run many experiments and we, these are the, re, the results where we had uh, a, a decent fit, a good fit, well, a fit that we could, uh, that validated all the, the, the conditions uh, to be valid. And so, and you see that uh, for neo hookian law, we have a constant value, which is what we are looking for because the properties should not depend on the deformation. Lambda is the general deformation, is the parameter uh, of the deformed capsule as a function of the initial diameter, original diameter. And so you see that when we, uh, well, we first see you, uh, first you see that we have large values of lambda up to 30% deformation, which tells you that the capsule is largely, is, has a long, large deformation. And secondly, you see that this capsule with albumin membrane follow a neo hooklin law, because that's when you have properties that do not depend on deformation, and they, they do not obey a, a strain hardening law, because we have a large dependence otherwise. Uh, on the definition, which is not physical, the material is the same. But to really make sure the microfluid technique was uh, correct, we decided to do the same experiment using a micro rheometer. So here it's a, it's a, it's a rheometer with two cylinders that are working in counter, uh, that are counter rotating. And we end up having a capsule that is stable, is a st that has a stationary shape in the, in the shear plane. And we, we could then measure the capsule deformation and, and do many measurements. Uh, and so we ended up having values that were really it's very similar. Uh, so the range uh, in the shaded areas of micro-rheometer uh, values. So these results were really recently published in the first uh, edition of FLOW, the new, the new journal of uh, JFM, or the little sister of JFM. And so now that was to show you how we can then get the elastic properties. To get the viscous one, the only way is to do a relaxation. There is the need of a transient, you need a, tr a transient moment, motion to be able to identify uh, the, the properties of viscosity. 
So we did experiments, I can show you the movie again. We did the microfluidic experiment, because this, this channel is 100 microns in thickness. Here, we end up uh, going into a 200 micron uh, micro channel. And this channel, and so we see here that the capsule first, uh, when well, first it's highly deformed, then, then it, it bulges out when it sees the larger uh, Flow environment, and then it flow. It finds it. It relaxes back to the new solution, where subjected to the new flow rate, to the new velocity. The flow rate is the same, but the velocity is decreased by two. So then we we follow the we follow the length. So the capsule that uh, the capsule length that is uh, so the, that is then decreasing over time. So we did an exponential fitting of the. Axle, the axle length uh, L y, or the transverse length, I should say, and we identified the relaxation time, the characteristic relaxation time. Uh, so this viscoelastic time, we find that we find value, and then if you have a model, so then you can use. Uh, well, we compare first with numerical simulation, and we found a very good fit. But there was this uh, small uh, time lapse or delay, and that was due to the viscoelasticity. So the viscoelasticity, we then find the value of the membrane viscosity uh, by using the, this uh, equation that was given well, it's from a paper from 2001, and that is uh, working really well to provide the value of the viscosity of the membrane. So that uh, that shows you that there is uh, these microcapsules that are made of albumin have some viscosity. It's not very large, but the solution uh, of the of the capsule, well, if you compare with numerical simulation without viscosity, you you're very close. But there is still an effect. There is a, this membrane, this small membrane viscosity, still has an impact of uh, and changes a little bit the response of the capsule. But now I will take a few minutes. I only have a few slides, but I will now finish with a second, with a reverse example, because here in a way we started from uh, well, we wanted we had experiments and we wanted to find the experiment to backtrack information. Now I'm showing you another example where we we started from numerical simulation. I, this simulation had been done by Lou in his PhD, and when I went. Uh, the defense uh, in 2014, uh, I discovered these results and I found them interesting. Lailai had found out that if you put an obstacle in a microfluidic channel, well, you can nicely salt capsules. So, it, because the capsules, the softer capsules will deform more, so the center, the center of mass of the capsule will flow very close to the obstacle, and so the trajectories after the obstacle are different based on the softness of the stiffness of the capsule. So he had come up with an idea on how old microcapsule based on the deformability, and then we did with my colleague Anne Le Goff, is to recreate uh, an experiment, but now uh, in the lab with using microfluidics, and we did so with Andrew in Manchester to calculate to 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 see whether these results could be translated into the the experimental world. So. Dignity and being able to, to sort objects based on deformability is really something that is important in practice. Indeed, uh, circ circulating cells, uh, the, or the deformability of circulating cells, are very important on the cell function. And also, many pathologies will change the, pro the, the deformability of the cell. So, so it's true for malaria, it's true for cancer, sepsis, also for, for white blood cell. Uh, will so the, the white blood cell stiffness will change in terms of sepsis. So in general, cell deformability is a biomarker of the cellular state. So there are there exist already some tools, some macrophilic tools, uh, to 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 sort objects or and microparticles based on their deformability, but many of them are quite are not that easy. Uh, they can also uh, clog over time. So in the end, uh, it's not there are not so many 
on shelf already uh, available tools uh, to do a sorting based on deformability. Then there's lots of tools to sort objects on soils, but much less on deformability. So we wanted to see whether the principle from the theoretical the numerical study of I like zoo was valid, uh, whether it was a good principle. So we, we, we took microcapsules, this time they were made of a valbumin, but they were of albumin capsules. And you see the obstacle here. And so the capsule then deforms, goes through the, the small uh, gap between the, the obstacle and the wall. And then the trajectory uh, changes depending on the deformability uh, of the microcapsule. Uh, so what, what we saw is that there is a possibility to not only sort the, the object by size, so that can be done at low flow rate. Small objects will flow, as you, so, as you see, cl close to the, to the channel, whereas large objects will flow away from the center of the channel. But you can also sort of base on deformability, because soft capsules uh, will, have, will go at very low angles, uh, and it will stay with a constant angle after one after a certain time because it's given by the, the size of the gap. Uh, whereas stiff capsules will have an angle that will change uh, depending on the, the size of the object. Uh, so we have uh, a, de a dependency, a large dependency on the deformability. And then you can have then, so how do you sort the object? You can just have different exits and so you then sack uh, the different portion of the uh, of the particles on the so you made them go into different outlets and in each outlet you will have uh, then objects of either of different sizes on the left or or objects of different properties mechanical properties on the right so at higher flow rates so i think it's time yeah it's 54 it's time to finish so just one slide of conclusion Today, I wanted to, to really go a little bit deeper into the numerical simulation and the challenges to the simulation for microcapsules or for such a, a complex free structure interaction problem, and to see how we can make simulation speak with numerical simulation and how they can work hand in hand to have practical applications. Because this work is quite theoretical initially, but we can end up having practical tools that have and simple devices, not only to characterize the mechanical properties of cells or, or microcapsules, but also for sorting and, uh, purposes. Now the challenge is on the experimental side is to go to the cell side, to the, to the size, and you know that whenever you go to a smaller size, the challenge is to is to to have well, you need to flow even at a larger speed or to 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 have cameras that would image even at a higher uh, frame rate. So it's not, it's not always easy to, to go to smaller sizes. Also, the, the pressure drop can increase. So you can end up having very, well, you need very large pressures to induce the flow. flow. Uh, Another challenge uh, is to, to take uh, into account the full uh, membrane properties, and since the membrane in practice always have the thickness, even if it's thin, but there it exists. So then sometimes the you, you may wonder: Do we need to take into account membrane rigidity or not? And do we need to uh, take into account the phenomena of damage or fatigue, uh, wrinkles, and and the uh, the, the existing uh, extension breakup or can lead to breakup? Or to fatigue phenomena. So we ended up, so we have, you have, I'm showing you references of very recent papers that we published where we take into account bending rigidity and also damage, which are very new. So it was done for the first time. That was a, a JFM paper from this year. And now, the, another world is the world of nucleated cells, and that op that leaves open another door, a big door, uh, where because the, there is the need then, if we want to have the numerical models adapted for nucleated cells, there is the need to to also take into account the presence of the nucleus. But that's that that will be for another time. And with that, I will just give you, uh, show you a picture of the group and to tell you that, yeah, many of the people, of these people contributed to the, the slides I showed you today. 
and that was true over the years. Uh, so I really want to thank everyone and it's a contribution by any, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne Virginia. Uh, well, while we are waiting for the questions, maybe I can maybe I can quickly ask one. Um, so you mentioned that uh, you do you account for porosity in in uh, of the membrane in the model or not yet? Not yet. Okay. And that's uh, indeed uh, uh, that's a very good question. And we we are so. With a colleague, we are uh, looking into that. With Bad Kawi, uh, who you see, let me, yeah, let me, let me put it is here. So Bad has worked a lot on the transfer and looking at the 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 link on the, and the coupling between fluid flow, internal and external fluid flow, and mass yeah, transfer yeah. Uh, through the membrane. And now our objective is to couple with the deformability of the capsule. So it's a it's a triple coupling because we have membrane deformability, fluid flows, and mass transfer. Hmm. Uh, will there also by mass transfer you mean like solutes or no? Solutes. Yeah. The yeah, diffusion. Oh, okay. Of, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mass, by mass and mass and that. Okay. Yes, oh. I could see that you you were a bit puzzled. Uh, no, that's no, no, sorry. Yeah. No. Okay. okay. Okay, are there any questions? Really, numerically, it's a big challenge because uh, we'll try. So it's it's something that has been really not done very much. Uh, so so there is something, whether it's done by Lattice, Boltzmann, or by any other method, uh, there is still a lot to do uh, also when, if you couple it with mass transfer. And it opens many questions or, or dilute or uh, the diffusion processes. It opens many questions on how uh, how the deformability changes. Another big uh, question is, for example, if you create poles or if you have an, uh, uh, a stimulation from outside, how will this stimulation uh, modify? So ultrasound can be one way to stimulate. To stimulate. But that's uh, that's something where there is very little in the literature. Sure. And can I ask, uh, this um, deformable cells being sorted is a fantastic uh, piece of fluid mechanics. Does the body ever use that phenomenon to try and sort cells within the body, for example, coming across exactly. membranes? You're completely right. That's exactly what happens. Uh, the body sorts um, red blood cells by deformability. So red blood cells, as you know, have no nucleus. It has been expelled. And uh, because of that, uh, it has only a certain lifetime. And the body, uh, and over time, like any other material, like our skin or anything, uh, the, it becomes more and more rigid. And it's through the deformability that the body will decide when the red blood cell has to be recycled and used again. And so, and, and then it's eaten by the macrophages, and that's done in the in the spleen. So each time, well, the spleen within you have a small slit that are on micro. As long as the micro, well, the, the red blood cells are deformed enough, then the red blood cells can go through. And at one point, when they're too old, they stuck. So I'll read the one from the chat box. So do you have a way to validate the identification of, gover of the governing parameters uh, from the database? Uh, well, the, the really the way uh, to validate is, well, there was two ways. First, we wanted to validate the measurement, and that's why we did a, a, a comparison between microfluidics and microreology with the same population, we wanted to make sure that what we measure, and I should go back on the slide. Uh, let me go back a few slides, not very far here. Uh, so you see that uh, what we measured in, in shaded area with the micro rheometer was in the same range. So that was the mean and max values that the, the mean is, is the, the value indicated here on the right. And you see that you, it fits quite well uh, for, for measurements that are so complex, we end, end up having a very good precision. Uh, and then in citative law, the only way is to, so you know that you have the right constitutive law 
if the value you find is independent of the defamation. In that case, you find the right, the right behavior. You are well modeling your capsule. So that's the, that's the criterion, is to have something as constant as possible. Sorry, yeah, hi, uh, great uh, work. I was just wondering, are you using these uh, deformability experiments to, and, and, the, and the, I'm sorry, the, the sorting experiments to backtrack the uh, elastic, elasticity of the membrane? We have not done it. Uh, and I know there is a, a paper online that, uh, that has been done by maybe you're working um, well, let me see, uh, with this group. We, we do not see how to precisely measure if the, the mechanical properties from the shape the capsule flowing through the gap. So we have not done it uh, on our side. But it's true that uh, online there is a possibility to find a paper where they try to, to guess the mechanical properties. Oh, using these sorting experiments, right? So using these sorting, the same concept of sorting experiments indeed, yes. So which, and it's true that doing in situ, so to, to doing the same, not only being able to do the sorting, but also being able to estimate the of stiffness is quite interesting. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank I don't know how precise, but I don't know. How, I'm not sure if that's precise. Right? That's why I will not. Uh, we have not done it because we. It's uh, it's never easy to 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 measure the mechanical properties of objects that are that small. Uh, so difficult to manipulate, and we, and we want we we wanted to make sure that whenever we propose a method, it's really validated. So you see that the microfluidic experiments is something we really trust. That's why I can put it forward because I, I, I really think that it's something trustable. We, we, we cross validated with other techniques, so it works out. And with this, uh, I'm not sure is that, uh, I don't know yet whether it's uh, valid. I just don't know. I'm not, I don't have any opinion. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, so uh, that came to, well, let me see, did you model the membrane viscosity elasticity by using the membrane uh, viscosity value you mentioned? We have not. So that was the question by Ali. We have not, and that's something we'd like to do. It's, it's quite, a, it's quite, always quite tricky to also implement this elasticity. So many groups like the group by Bakshi has done it. Uh, but there are there are lots of uh, there are many numerical issues and because of implementing uh, membrane viscoelasticity, it's uh, it's quite a, uh, a complicated problem. So in the end, we've not done it yet because we were focusing on other problems. And since the elasticity, the viscosity of this uh, of our capsule is very small and it has less effects than on red blood cells, for example. So, so, so that's why we, we have not done it personally, but it exists in the literature. And I, for example, uh, propose you to have a look at what, uh, uh, what uh, Professor Bakshi has done. I suppose like at some point the stress on the capsule can get like high enough so that it breaks. And you showed at the beginning the experiments where it happens, but when the, the, the capsule enters like a smaller channel, is it ever possible, like, have you observed it in like, in the normal channels that you use without constriction? Yeah. That yeah. for some flooring? Yeah. Ah. I, I knew I should have put another picture in my presentation. In the end, I haven't. Let me, let me try to, to quickly get it and I'll show you. Uh, well, we do find capsules that explode and that uh, because they, it's also because they have this strain, this strain softening uh, property. Uh, so the capsule elongates forever. And in the end, it, uh, it breaks off. Let me go, uh, I, the easiest way is to move to this page. I quickly stop sharing and share another page. Uh, I need to find, yeah, here we go. So that's the paper. At one point, I told you about the paper in flow, and here, here you see a capsule uh, 
uh, that we have managed to follow to follow a little bit uh, within the channel, and you see the break that is breaking up. Uh, so suddenly it elongates so much that it breaks. In picture B, it has bro broken up at the tip. So we do see breakup in, in microchannel. We do see. We also see breakup in the microrheometer. Uh, so and we are currently studying breakup uh, in this device, in both devices actually. So that's one of the things that we are studying uh, strongly these days. Oh, very really interesting. Okay. Because uh, now we have we have the advantage of having the numerical model, and since there are hardly any experimental results in the literature, so we are also doing the experiments these days. And so next time, if you want, I'll come and show you results on that. All right. <laughs> For another series. <laughs>